Hi, everyone, and welcome to this webinar on digital activism in times of pandemic. This event is organized by uh, the Center for Digital Culture at King's College London, uh, which I direct. My name is Paolo Gerbaudo, and I'm a researcher in digital culture and politics at King's College London. And is co-organized by uh, RC47, uh, the research committee number 47 of the International Sociological Association. It is one of many research committees that uh, bring together sociologists working on specific issues. And in the case of RC47, the specific topic is social movements and social classes which is obviously very relevant to what uh, we are discussing today, namely how people are using online tactics, online tools in order to confront uh, the present situation of emergency, the coronavirus pandemic, and all the related social and economic issues that are emerging around this pandemic. Because as we all know too well by now, it is really a crisis that brings together so many levels, so many different issues and problems and many issues that people need to mobilize against uh, given the nefarious effects they may have on people thinking about poverty unemployment and so on and so forth this webinar is actually the third webinar that is being organized to date by uh, rc47 uh, there have been a number of other events most of them obviously connected to obviously coronavirus and social movements how social movements are reacting on uh, so many fronts vis-a-vis uh, -vis this emergency. And RC47 uh, is also very active. Otherwise, it has a section on the Open Democracy online website called Open Movements. And if you go there, you'll be able to see a lot of material uh, related to this nexus between uh, social movements and, and current times of crisis and uh, very interesting articles and information uh, from uh, very qualified sociologists working on these uh, all over the world. So coming to, to today's event, the, the point of this uh, uh, online event is to look at how uh, during this exceptional phase, activists have tried to react and adapt to the situation by utilizing a number of different online tools, different online tactics as a means to organize and, and, and mobilize in these uh, uh, very peculiar circumstances. Now, obviously, digital activism is not something that is uh, new at all. I mean, already for several years, if not decades, we have witnessed to activists using a variety of tools and online tactics as a means to uh, campaign, uh, to mobilize on different issues and themes. But obviously, this situation in a way makes online activism even more important than it was the case before, uh, for a very simple reason, uh, because mass demonstration, physical demonstrations that are still the most typical form of collective action when people are concerned about something and want to demonstrate their collective concern on that is, is uh, not available. All protests are off for, for the time being, uh, meaning that mobilization needs to find other spaces, need to find other ways to express itself. I mean, it is true that we had some uh, physical demonstrations even in these days. I mean, besides the crazy ones we saw in Michigan and other states in the US with people armed with automatic rifles uh, going to the capital, uh, to the local state capital to call for the end of the lockdown. But we also saw, for example, protests in, in Israel uh, to protest against Netanyahu, which was quite interesting because it was a social distancing protest. I mean, the, the pictures were quite striking. You could see this mass of people, but all respecting distance. And you had a very similar scene in, in Athens, right? Uh, mm -hmm. For the 1st of May demonstration where you had people gathering in, in, in the square, uh, though uh, while at the same time respecting social distancing uh, measures. But these again are quite exceptional events uh, in, in, in present times because most people in most countries, and we're talking about billions of people, are actually forced to stay at home. And uh, they are forced to stay at home at a time when uh, political institutions are making very important decisions about them. 
decisions that may impact them and, and their children uh, for a generation uh, when uh, social inequality and its effects are being very uh, acutely felt across different sectors of society. I mean, let's think about uh, the main people who are unemployed or who are in a very precarious situations being um, guaranteed temporary income only for a very short period of time uh, as it is happening in, in the UK with furloughed workers. Or uh, let's think about also and, and, and with concerns about privacy, uh, there is a lot of concern now uh, from many people uh, about the use of contact tracing apps, for example. There's also concerns about other issues that don't have to do directly with the pandemic, but in a way are related to that. In particular, I'm thinking about climate change. Uh, what many people, many climate campaigners, for example, are, are uh, highlighting is the fact that this is a bit of a stress test for much worse crises to come in the future, starting from climate change. However, it is not possible for activists at the moment to go to public squares or to protest in public due to lockdown measures. And it's very interesting how activists are reacting to this situation and thinking about the way in which, for example, uh, climate activists of the sunrise movement in the US are now turning to phone banking or to online uh, pickets, online activism in, in different ways. I'm thinking about how activists are calling flash mobs online. Uh, sometimes simply to celebrate carers and it, this has been a very important uh, theme uh, throughout these days a club for carers club for workers these public demonstrations of, of solidarity uh, towards essential workers uh, whose uh, work we discovered we should have known before but is really essential to society's reproduction but also more, uh, say, contentious and conflict-oriented forms of, of, of action. I mean, for example, in Spain, there were uh, caceroladas, uh, namely banging pot protests that were called online via flash mobs from different, from, by different political uh, factions. Uh, one protest was called by uh, Republican, pro-Republic protesters against the monarchy. Another such protest, another such caserolada protest was instead called by the far right uh, uh, box party and there's many many more forms of online activism or online uh, social media enabled activism we, we could say that we uh, see uh, we witness emerging at so very different latitudes i mean uh, for example makers uh, getting on board producing masks that couldn't be sourced from the global market uh, people organizing mutual aid groups locally using online tools uh, to new forms, say, of propaganda or uh, is uh, raising issues uh, via memes, uh, live streams and other forms on, of online activism. So this is a bit the menu we have today. It is a very rich set of issues that we will discuss and we will do that uh, with uh, an excellent uh, array of participants. Uh, we will have with us Anastasia Cavada, who is a reader in media politics at the School of Media and Communication at the University of Westminster. And her research focuses precisely on the links between digital media, social movements and, and social change. And I think she has much to say about current developments and what is going on at the moment in online uh, activism. We will also have Marisa Fombulo, who is uh, a political scientist and associate professor at the University of Brasilia. Uh, she's the author of Building Transnational Networks and Social Movement Dynamics, New Perspectives on Theory and Research from Latin America, among many other works. A re uh, recent research deals with social movements and digital activism in Brazil and, and Chile. I think Marisa's contrib contribution is very important to give us, uh, help us uh, project a more global perspective of what is going on and in particular uh, Brazil is a very uh, important hotspot uh, both for the pandemic and, and politically uh, more broadly and uh, third we'll have uh, with us uh, Mengin Li who recently completed her PhD at the Department of Digital Humanities at King's College London 
Uh, Menging is currently writing a book on Weibo and uh, WeChat's involvement in Chinese online activism and is about to join the journalism school at uh, Shanghai Fudan University as a postdoctoral research fellow. Her research focuses on digital cultures, social media and online activism. And uh, I think also Menging's contribution here will be very important for us as she can give us a sense of how these uh, developments are uh, taking shape uh, in, in China, how the Chinese public has been reacting to these, how Chinese citizens use a variety of uh, both to information and to campaign around issues uh, related uh, to the pandemic. And our uh, fourth guest today is Winnie Wong. Uh, Winnie Wong is a US activist uh, who has been involved in so many campaigns that uh, it would be uh, too long to list. Uh, she most uh, recently, she has been the senior political advisor to the Bernie Sanders 2020 campaign. Uh, at the moment, she's not with us yet. I think she's very busy at the moment, but let's see if she can join our discussion later on. So this is what we are going to do today. The event is going to go on for around uh, one hour and 30 minutes. Each presentation will be uh, around uh, 10 minutes. Uh, all the participants, all the attendants in uh, this webinar can uh, write using the Q&A chat. You can write your questions, you can write your comments, you can participate in the discussion. And after all the presentations, there will actually be a Q&A uh, session where I will uh, pick some of the questions the public uh, has made and direct them uh, to the speakers. So thanks very much for being here today with us. And I'm now uh, uh, introducing Anastasia Cavada. Please, Anastasia. Hello, and let me share my screen with you. Hello everyone, I hope you, you can see this. Um, hello and welcome. Um, and Paolo, many thanks for uh, the invitation. Um, so today I will be focusing on mutual aid groups formed um, around COVID-19 in the UK. And at the moment, uh, there are currently uh, 3,493 such groups um, across the United Kingdom. Um, so what is it that they do? Um, these, are, uh, for, these are formed by neighbours uh, who are helping those who are self-isolating either because they're sick or because they are in a vulnerable category. And basically what they do is that they're running errands for people who cannot leave home. They're picking up shopping or prescriptions. Um, they may make uh, friendly phone calls. They may be posting mail or paying bills in the post office for people or walking their dogs. Um, so all kinds of sort of like simple, uh, simple errands here. Um, so why focus on these uh, mutual aid groups? Um, to be honest, one of the reasons was well, that when Paolo asked me whether I had something to present here, I thought I'm one of the organizers of one of these groups. And I thought, you know, I could combine my personal observations because I haven't done sort of like the proper empirical research, it's too early yet, uh, with some desk research in order to talk about this interesting phenomenon. Uh, but the more academic uh, justification for this is that I think that um, groups like that are often overlooked in research on digital activism. Um, I think uh, the emphasis is much more on protest, on public solidarity, on the expression of public solidarity. It is much less on organizing and capacity building. Uh, partly, I think it's because these groups are not considered to be very political. Uh, they deal with care, so they often considered to be apolitical. Um, so to give you an example, while there is a lot of published research on the Occupy movement back from 2011, there is much less work, academic work on Occupy Sunday, uh, which was uh, the effort by Occupy volunteers to offer hurricane relief when Hurricane Sandy hit New York in 2012. Um, and because we don't focus as much on the organizing and capacity building aspects, I think the focus lies very much on social media like Facebook and Twitter, but we talk much less about internal communication and for instance, messaging apps like WhatsApp. Uh, so I think there are several reasons why we should be looking um, at, um, um, at mutual aid groups. 
Um, so what are the origins of these groups in the in the UK? I think most of them started around the 10th of March, although it's very difficult to put an, an exact date because they started popping up all around the, their place. Um, there were call outs on Facebook and Twitter for people to create their own group in their locality by starting a WhatsApp group or a Facebook page. Uh, so on your right, you see such a, a call out from uh, the Hackney COVID-19 uh, Facebook page. Um, and you see all of the groups that were created by then. That was uh, from the 12th of March um, and all of the WhatsApp groups that were created by that time. Um, so uh, they were very small and local and they started organizing themselves according to the electoral ward. Uh, so it was a, one way in which you could carve up um, uh, the localities, uh, but smaller is better. So for uh, much the, the larger um, electoral wards, what we see uh, was that micro groups where they were separated in micro groups that were uh, focusing on specific streets and on specific neighborhoods. Um, so here smaller was better in that respect. Um, so WhatsApp alongside Facebook was one of the main platforms for organizing. Um, so each group for every ward um, has its own um, has its own WhatsApp group. But soon what started happening um, is that you, they started creating different WhatsApp groups for different functions. So there might be one for taking requests uh, for people who need help. Another one where volunteers can talk to each other. Another one for people who run in the phone line. Another one for organizers and another one for general discussion and chat. Because one of the problems that you realize, you know, uh, one of the problems of organizing with WhatsApp um, is that there is um, a lot of information overload. Um, it seems that information can actually get lost in the, in the flow. Um, a lot of people are using it to chat instead of focusing on the organizing tasks. Um, new members do not really have access to previous discussions and one of the problems of the information overload is that people have to mute their WhatsApp groups because they're receiving too many notifications. And of course, groups have a limit of 256 participants, uh, which is why some of the larger wards started to create uh, smaller mi micro groups um, in order to be able to service um, everyone in the area that was requesting help. Um, but WhatsApp was only uh, was only one um, aspect of this. Of course, there were websites on WordPress and perhaps some newsletters as well. Uh, but the day to day organizing was done through all of these platforms that you will recognize if you're working online and from home, because this is what everybody is using nearly every day. Uh, so there is Zoom for calls involving organizers and volunteers, Slack for the organizing needs that cannot be uh, covered by WhatsApp because Slack is very good. It's much better when it comes to sort of like organizing projects, uh, Skype in order to operate common phone lines, uh, Gmail to have an email address for the group, um, Google Docs uh, to record the minutes of meetings, uh, to write statements and also the guidelines for the volunteers of the group. Um, and then Google Sheets and Google Forms uh, in order to create databases of the volunteers, but also of the people who request uh, help and to record information about pharmacies and shops in the area. So you see here is sort of like a, a quite diverse uh, digital infrastructure uh, being created. Uh, but it's not only digital. As we know, um, in with every kind of activism, um, it's very, uh, it's not very often that everything happens, uh, uh, that everything happens only online. Uh, so leaflets and posters were also used in order to reach people who were self-isolating at home and those who didn't have access to the technology, didn't have the, the literacy skills. Um, or they didn't have a smartphone. So there was mass leafleting at people's homes, putting up posters in shops and in the street. And here you see the problems, I think, with um, COVID-19 um, because the problems with having this kind of physical and paper media. Um, there was a lot of discussion um, in the beginning around how you do leafleting in a, in a proper way so that you don't spread the virus and the development of very detailed health and safety guidelines for, for volunteers uh, who are doing this. Um, and in terms of national coordination, there is a national website, uh, COVID-19 uh, Mutual Aid UK, um, and one administrator from every, um, every mutual aid group can also join a closed Facebook group where they can exchange information. Uh, but the truth is that at least in the beginning, the learning was happening in a much more bottom up and organic and actually it was 
pretty fast uh, with people just following what neighboring wards were doing and sort of like exchanging emails and exchanging information um, and learning from each other uh, really, really quickly. But in a rather, you could say, chaotic way to an extent. Um, and sometimes there was an element of reinventing the wheel in, in, in some cases, uh, but it was pretty fast and very organic. So what, what I think we have here is the development of a hyper-local infrastructure of care. And that infrastructure includes not only the technical aspects, the digital platforms and all of the applications that people are using, uh, but it also includes the organizational practices and the social norms uh, that people are developing when they're using this kind of infrastructure. Um, so the ways of working when it comes to the volunteers uh, who are creating this kind of community of practice, uh, but it is not only the volunteers, it's also the requesters who are also learning how to use uh, how to use that system. So you have organizational practices and social norms, but also interpersonal relationships amongst all of these people being developed. And often uh, I think this depends also on how diverse and heterogeneous the, each locality is, but often these kinds of relationships go across generations and across political differences, across differences of race, gender or ethnicity. Um, and I think some of the characteristics of this hyper um, local infrastructure of care uh, come much more to the fore if we compare and contrast this model of organizing with a national health service volunteer responder uh, service. So you see here um, our, um, our health minister Matt Hancock launching uh, this service um, on the 24th of March. Um, 2,250,000 people were urged to become volunteers for the national health service. Um, and within a few days, 750,000 people have actually registered um, and they had to stop the recruitment and they're still not recruiting uh, because they didn't have the, the power to actually process all of these applications. And still, you know, some people haven't been assigned tasks. Um, so it, it has been a very slow process. Uh, so if we were to compare and contrast, we see that the NHS service is much uh, slower. It's, it's it launched later than the mutual aid groups. Um, and that is because it is much larger, um, because it is trying from a top down and very centralized way to coordinate all of these uh, volunteers. Uh, while the mutual aid groups are much smaller, which make them, makes them more agile and more nimble. Um, uh, the NSS service is a much more formal group, which means that those people who request information uh, should be registered as, as vulnerable uh, in order to be helped. So this leaves out a lot of people uh, who do not fall within this category or who don't want to be formally registered for various reasons, uh, because perhaps the citizenship status um, is not confirmed or whatever. Um, so in some of these informal groups may have a better um, uh, maybe more responsive in that sense because they can service everybody um, who requests help. Um, and when it comes to the infrastructure, the NHS has partnered with a company that produces the Good Samaritan app. Uh, so you have a private company here um, that I think also complicates uh, personal data management um, and ownership. Uh, so uh, no, nothing is perfect here. Um, everybody is trying to follow GDPR rules. Um, for the mutual aid groups, effectively, you have some volunteers who have access to the, some of the personal information for the volunteers and for those requesting information is password protected. Uh, some of the requests are deleted, but still you need to entrust these people, but they have access only to the to information relating to the specific smaller locality. Uh, while the Good Sum Up has access to information about the whole service, the whole 750,000 people. And if you actually look at the contract, they may be able to retain some of that, of that information later on. Um, and, and when it comes to the type of care, I think what, the, what we see with the NHS is that I think it's following much more of a charity model. There's more of a separation between the volunteers who are offering help and those who are needing, who, who need help, who are the vulnerable. Um, so there is sort of like a relationship of power there and it's kind of sort of like charitable feeling. Um, mutual aid groups, I think, operate on a much more horizontal uh, basis. And this is where I want to challenge um, all of these sort of like observations and descriptions that they are apolitical. So if you look at how mutual aid is actually described on the COVID-19 uh, Mutual Aid UK website, um, it does focus very much on self-organization, of, of people organizing outside the formal frameworks of charities, NGOs and the government. 
And he said that it is a horizontal mode of organizing. Individuals are supposed to be equally powerful. They're supposed to be working together as equal. It's not about saving everyone. Um, and I think we see that with those groups. Of course, some people are much more vulnerable uh, to COVID-19 than others, uh, but still this is a disease that anybody can get. Um, so this means that you know a volunteer can also be a requester in a week. So it creates, fl it flattens a little bit that hierarchy. Now I'm not saying that people are viewing it in a political way, not everyone, um, not every group, not everyone, but it has the, I think this kind of sort of more political meaning. Um, so moving forwards, um, I'm wondering what would be the political potential um, of these mutual aid groups. And perhaps one question, which in my view is not the most interesting one, uh, is what could be their influence on local government and local elections? Um, but for me, a much more interesting question is what we have will happen now that we are moving into different campaigns in different in a different phase of the COVID-19 uh, crisis, because what we have here is, as I said, a hyper local infrastructure of care. What does this care mean as a lot of people are becoming unemployed? Uh, what does it mean as people are losing their homes? They cannot pay for their rent. But what is happening to the labor rights? And already I think the crisis is becoming much more politicized, even though there are so many calls not to politicize the crisis. So if there are questions about why people from specific ethnic or uh, racial backgrounds or people from deprived areas are more affected by COVID-19. Um, so it is a question about whether this infrastructure can be used for mobilization, for circulating information. And I think what is important to remember here is the interpersonal relationships. So this is not an abstract thing about unemployment. It's not an abstract campaign. It is actually you who cared for your neighbors um, and run errands for them and have created a relationship with them. And now you're part of a WhatsApp group and suddenly these people are becoming unemployed and they're becoming homeless. Um, so it's a much more, I think, grassroots and grounded uh, a view of what you know campaigning will, will look like and people's motivations to participate in this kind of campaigning uh, will be like. So thank you very much. And please contact me if you'd like to discuss it further. Thanks very much, Anastasia, for your presentation. And now it's Marisa von Bulo's turn. Thank you very much. Let me just put my presentation up. I hope you can see it. Yes. Thank you very much for the invitation, Paolo, everybody. Thank you. Um, this is an amazing panel and Anastasia gave a, a, a very impressive and interesting uh, talk. Coming from Brazil, there are a lot of things that can be said about the use of digital activism. As Paulo said, Brazil is currently a hot spot, unfortunately, not for good uh, reasons. I decided to spend my 10 minutes talking to you about how the poorest communities, the ones that are being most uh, affected by the virus and by uh, the economic consequences of the pandemic. Uh, how these poor communities, organizations in these poor communities are using digital uh, activism. But we cannot really understand uh, activism in Brazil nowadays without taking uh, a step back and talking very quickly about the political context of this uh, activism. So very quickly, uh, I want to highlight um, the fact that in Brazil in the past decade, Brazilian politics has become more and more polarized, leading to the election of a far right wing president two years ago, Jair Bolsonaro. You can see him here in this in this picture. And the pandemic has not led to diminished polarization. Why in other countries like uh, Argentina, to give uh, an example, also in South America, politicians have come together. Uh, in a unified front. In Brazil, this has not uh, happened uh, quite, actually quite the contrary. The pandemic has been uh, used as an opportunity to further disagreement, antagonism among political actors, and uh, this picture uh, symbolizes this. The Brazilian president has insisted on being on the streets, has insisted on downplaying the seriousness of the uh, pandemic and questioning uh, isolation policies. These are images that are being distributed uh, in WhatsApp uh, groups. 
um, from, by uh, conservative actors, you can see here um, the message is um, faith, not science, will uh, save us. In short, this means that in Brazil there is no current coherent national uh, strategy to fight the, the pandemic. And it is in this context that activists in poor communities, I'm talking about um, social movements, talking about uh, human rights NGOs, talking about uh, media activists and just volunteers in general have tried to step in to fill the void left uh, by, by the state. And they do not only have to uh, fight uh, uh, the virus without help from the state or with little help from local authorities, but they also have to fight the misinformation campaign. They also have to fight uh, false news, if you prefer to use um, that term. So the message is um, we need uh, social isolation policies. That is the way uh, to go. However, we also need social protection to make sure these uh, social isolation policies are feasible to make sure that people actually survive social isolation um, policies. What can we say in terms of uh, new trends in digital activism from um, these poor uh, communities? So to uh, accomplish these uh, goals of uh, mobilizing and fighting misinformation, uh, organizations have turn to digital activism in a big way. And of course, like Paulo said, digital activism is not new. We have at least two and a half decades of digital activism, but it is new in this context. Now, um, a lot of these uh, organizations in uh, Brazilian slums, which actually have around 12 uh, million people living in them, did not have a significant digital presence in part because of problems of internet access of their constituencies. This of course has changed uh, a lot in the past few years because of the uh, easier, cheaper access to, to the internet through uh, smartphones. Um, but what I mean is that uh, these organizations are latecomers to the digital uh, arena with a, a few notable uh, exceptions. So these are uh, new trends. They have been using um, more tools, but in less sophisticated than what um, Anastasia was talking uh, about. Mostly we're talking about um, Instagram, Facebook and, and WhatsApp, although we don't, we still do not have um, a lot of data on, on this, but mostly traditional tools, but uh, much more than they used uh, before. So they are having greater online visibility through the launching of dozens of hashtag uh, campaigns of uh, hundreds of crowdfunding initiatives and uh, Facebook groups and so on. Another new trend that's actually very interesting is that uh, they have made uh, an effort to better integrate platforms and platforms and offline strategies. So the picture you see here is of um, a slum in Sao Paulo, one of the largest ones uh, in uh, Brazil. And uh, the soccer field is being used to uh, have a, a meeting among organizers in the slum with social distancing, something unthinkable uh, a couple of months um, ago. And uh, these volunteers were recruited um, through social media and they coordinate their activities on the ground through WhatsApp uh, groups. So among the um, goals uh, of these more specific goals of uh, these actors, we have been uh, mapping them uh, in our research group at the University of Brasilia. I have the, the link to our website uh, at the bottom of the slide. Unfortunately, everything is still in, in Portuguese, but we will be working on uh, trying to translate and you can get in touch with me, of course, if you want uh, uh, specific examples. But uh, most of the campaigns we have been mapping uh, are directed at uh, raising awareness about uh, the virus and translating information. So getting the technical, reliable, of course, scientific information on the virus and adapting the language 
so that uh, people can uh, understand it uh, better. Uh, a lot also, of course, uh, and this picture shows it, this, uh, it's mobilizing donors. Um, a lot of uh, the activities are related to mobilizing the state. So to, to sum it up, not um, as not so much the focus has been on protests, the focus has been on organization, on uh, relief. These organizations are on emergency mode. Their main main goal is to keep people healthy and to make sure they have food on, on the table. And uh, all of these um, are uh, positive uh, trends, more tools being used, uh, more tools being better used and better integrated with offline uh, strategies. I want to finish my initial presentation by talking also about the challenges this sort of activism faces. Uh, one of these challenges is related to uh, inequality. As we well know, digital activism also requires resources. Today, one of these um, organizations in Rio was asking people to donate cell phones and to donate minutes um, so they could uh, work uh, better. So what we have seen is that, um, that organizations that have more resources are more visible online, and this means that actually digital activism can reproduce inequalities within the most vulnerable uh, communities. and. Um, reproduce uh, visibility differences, so more organized uh, groups that not necessarily are the ones that need most help are the most visible on uh, social social media. And the second challenge, uh, obvious one, is the challenge of sustainability. Activists themselves have to face very dif difficult circumstances. They get tired. Um, donations uh, tend to, to get scarcer in the next few weeks, so civil society alone cannot face um, the virus. That's it for now. Thank you very much. Thanks very much for your presentation, Marisa, and for giving us a sense of how things are developing in Brazil. And now is Menging Li's term. turn. Please, Menging. Hi, uh, hi everyone. Uh, I'm Menging. Uh, thank you very much, Paulo, for the invitation. Um, I'm very happy to be here to share with you some of my observations on Chinese online activism during the coronavirus outbreak. Um, in the past few months, uh, various forms of online activism have appeared in China and social media has been used to mobilize support and raise donations for people in Wuhan. And we also see similar things like mutual aid group, uh, especially on WeChat. WeChat has been used to organize volunteer work to help deliver supplies and to drive uh, house workers to and from hospitals. Um, but I decided to talk to you mainly about uh, online activism on Weibo during the, the early days of the outbreak. And there are two reasons why I made that decision. Uh, first, because uh, I'm based in the UK and didn't get a chance to, to be engaged in both local groups in China. And instead, I've been mainly observing people's reactions to the lockdown and to the pandemic through the microblogging service Weibo. And the second reason uh, is because, as I will show you in my presentation, a lot of people in China now, they are attempting to documenting and producing their own storytelling of what had happened at the beginning of the outbreak. So as a researcher, I hope this is my way of uh, recording this part of the history. So um, the city of Wuhan was locked down on the 23rd of January. Around three days after the lockdown, I started to see some patients at Wuhan asking for help on Weibo because at that time the local healthcare system was overwhelmed and many patients couldn't get a bed uh, in hospitals. So they turned to Weibo to ask for attention to their desperate situations. And immediately there emerged a super topic called pneumonia patients asking for help, which aggregates many of these posts sent by patients and their relatives 
this super topic is a feature very similar to Twitter's uh, hashtag. Uh, users add a tag in their posts, then their messages will pop up when others searching for relevant keywords. But uh, yeah, also a bit like a Facebook uh, group page in a sense that each tag has a corresponding topic page, which not only displays the post, but also share how many people have viewed and follow this topic. Uh, I checked my uh, the screenshots I took on 3rd of February, which is about 10 days after the lockdown. The topic had around 4,000 messages and uh, 300 million views. And I checked the number yesterday. Um, the number of views was 5 billion. So you could see uh, it got a lot of attention. And the topic page uh, includes not only posts sent by patients in Wuhan, but also people from other areas. Many were expressing their sympathies, grief and rage, and people were discussing how can we help both residents in Wuhan. And there were also intense criticisms of the ways the authorities handled the crisis and how they held information from the public. But on around 4th February, uh, a lot of posts were deleted and their message from the service provider the Sina Weibo company was pinned at the top of the page and first it uh, explained vaguely about the deletion of messages is that this super topic page will be used to help collect information on people need help in Wuhan. So irrelevant information might be hidden so that they could focus on helping those really in need of help. So it means that people who were not patients but rather used the tech to share their thoughts and criticisms would uh, not be visible. And second, the company suggested patients to contact the platform to have their identity verified so that it could tackle rumors and to avoid that some people might be fabricating the situation in Wuhan. And third, uh, which was uh, quite unusual, I would say, the platform provided a post template and urged the users to follow the same format when posting in this uh, super topic. The template includes names, uh, address, phone number, a description of symptoms. And again, they justified this as to assist those in need of medical care to get help as soon as possible. So, because I've been uh, observing and archiving posts in this super topic since uh, the beginning, um, by comparing the posts sent by patients before and after the platform's intervention, I saw a very big difference there. So before the platform intervened, uh, while asking for help, many posts include a lot of uh, emotional expressions. They describe their desperate situations. They share their observations of what was happening in the hospitals in their neighborhoods. And some told uh, very touching stories of their loved ones and others raised important questions on accountability. And these messages had strong effects on mobilizing emotions and participation from the public. And in fact, many previous uh, internet protests in China follow the same pattern of beginning with their individual's uh, grievance and then spread rapidly online and lead to national outrage. But after the platform intervened, uh, most of those uh, emotional expressions were gone. And instead, people adopted the same format, used relatively like plain language to describe their their symptoms to describe their basic information and many people even attached the images of their CT scans and medical records because they are so desperate to get help and they want to show that they are really uh, patients. So you could see how a space of contention has been transformed to a helpline and the uh, also, the authorities also responded, highlighting that uh, the various channels were being used and the enormous efforts have been made on helping people getting uh, medical care they need. And it needs to be said that many patients did get help after posting on Weibo. They received uh, calls from volunteers, from local officials and community workers. And later, after things getting better in Wuhan, more and more people were able to get hospitalized. And the super topic, if you check it now, uh, it was filled with posts expressing gratitude to med uh, med medical workers, to netizens and uh, volunteers. And the Weibo company further incorporated this story into its discourses around how the platform had fulfilled its social responsibility, maintained a live channel for patients in Wuhan and successfully assisted the government in helping people getting medical care in time. And the platforms that like uh, they received uh, over 10,000 messages from patients asking for help. And after verifying the information, they reported more than 3,000 cases to local authorities.
And today, what had happened uh, at the beginning of this coronavirus outbreak in China was rarely mentioned by state-owned media outlets. And these stories of uh, Wuhan patients seeking help online, where you can see it uh, being incorporated into a grand narrative of the resist resilience and the sacrifice of Chinese people who helped the country win the battle over the virus. So. Using this example, I wanted to show you uh, a complex process of neutralizing uh, online contention and uh, demobilizing griefs and angers. And I also want to draw your attention to the role played by the platform provider by Sina Weibo Company, um, which obviously attempted to manage the political risks uh, associated with uh, these patients' posts, but they also want to take credit from uh, helping the public. So I think it again shows the difficulties of mobilizing actions on uh, rely overly uh, like relying on those big platforms and it shows the need to look for alternative media or space. But um, there are also a lot of pushbacks uh, in different forms against either the platforms or the authorities' narratives. The remaining crowdsourced efforts on collecting and archiving personal accounts on people's life in lockdown. And every day there are thousands of people leaving comments on the whistleblower Dr. Li Wenliang's Weibo account to share their sadness and hope to describe how they cope with their lives during this period. And a persistent topic we can find there was to remind each other not to forget the sorrows and anger we felt at this moment and to develop our own storytelling of this pandemic. So I think that's a, a very historic moment, I would say. And uh, so that's it. Uh, if we have time, we can discuss it further. Yeah, thank you. Bria, thanks so much, Mingying, for your presentation and for giving us this very vivid picture of what is happening in China with activism in these times of pandemic. I uh, was waiting for Winnie Wong to join us, but I don't think we can find her. So uh, we have a bit more space for our own discussion. There have already been a number of questions from our attendants and please, everybody uh, watching this, please feel free to write your question in the Q&A uh, chat. I think I'll uh, uh, select some of the questions and some of the kind of common threads uh, going through these questions and, uh, and, try and get speakers to uh, engage uh, with them. I mean, there's many themes that are already there in, in the questions. I think one theme uh, has to do with, uh, um, I'd say, the sociodemographics of these. So there was a question directed specifically to Marisa uh, regarding, uh, I mean, the extent of access uh, to these information and tools in communities, especially when it comes to um, poor communities. I mean, obviously there is a question there uh, having to do with the digital divide, which is uh, particularly, I mean, it's still important, right? And uh, at so many levels, we also see it, for example, in schools with uh, an assumption being made that all children have access to a computer and internet at home, which is still not the case for a small but a significant uh, percentage of the population. And I guess one question there is has to do with that. And another question, Mm, always in a way on social demographics has more to do, I think, with, with a kind of mm, profile of activists uh, doing this. Namely, uh, are they young or old, women or men? Uh, what kind of, are they urban or rural? Um, what kind of people are involved in that? And then let's say there is a more general question that there's other questions we will we look at in, in further rounds of questions. Um, a more general question I think also is, is important. I mean, what are we talking about when we are talking about digital activism? Uh, somebody asked that in a sense, how could we define it or how do you see it um, when you're speaking about online activism and digital activism? Uh, what is your understanding of these phenomena? So perhaps we follow just the same order we use for the presentations. I mean, I'll just ask you to really give quite brief answers, say kind of four or five minutes each so that we have then more time for more questions and so we make it as interactive as we can. 
So please, Anastasia. Uh, thanks, Paolo. Um, I'll start from the last question and then I, uh, I'll do the second one. Um, so digital activism, um, with all due respect to the title of this webinar, I have stopped using digital activism that much as a term. I think perhaps it's better to think of digital media and activism. And because um, in, in my experience, activism um, happens on different media. Some of them are digital, some of them are not uh, digital. Uh, what we see though with COVID-19 is of course more of a move to the digital because um, the face-to-face -face and paper media have become uh, much more difficult to deal with for obvious reasons. Uh, but we see that even in this case, in the case studies that we have presented here, um, that the people still need to rely um, on other types of media uh, to do so. Um, so um, it's a long way of saying, I don't know how to answer what is digital activism and <laughs> and perhaps digital media and activism is a better way of thinking about it. Um, to answer the second question, I think this is um, interrelated. Um, so uh, what we also see is that, you know, for people who do not have access to the technology and sometimes these are the more vulnerable people that you would like to um, to help, although I think that depends on the country. And we are also making assumptions about vulnerable people and technology that are often not uh, right, uh, for example. Um, but it was important for us. So um, I'm organizing with the Shackerwell board, uh, which is in Hackney. Uh, Hackney is a quite gentrified borough on the one hand, but also very deprived. Um, so you see these kinds of, it's a quite diverse community in this respect. Um, so in order to be able to help people, uh, we needed to distribute leaflets, but also to have a phone number for them to call. So it's a simply a uh, phone. And I think more could be done with other technologies like simple texting, not WhatsApp, for people who do not have access uh, to smartphones. Um, so we might have to go back and, and think about, you know, different uh, kinds of technologies here. Uh, but I don't have data to share with you around uh, the sociological and the, the makeup of, of these groups. I think it's too early to know. We know that millions of people um, are involved. We know that there are nearly 3,500 groups um, across the UK, some of them in rural areas, so villages. Uh, and they have a very di different, like I was looking at the Facebook page of a small village in South Norfolk, conservative. Uh, which has a mutual aid group and you know they it's very much sort of like the village organizing um, uh, around offering support and help. So yeah so I'll stop here um, and let Marisa also answer some of these questions. Yes I would um, can you see me? Yes. There was a, a question about uh, activism without uh, technology from someone from South Africa, I think it, it's, it's an interesting question because we don't, we, we tend sometimes not to think about that anymore. Those of us who are studying digital uh, activism. Um, however, we have to remember that South Africa as Brazil as well and many other countries, they have a long tradition of activism without uh, technology and I think that the, the question was specifically uh, about poor uh, communities and, and these people can use previous experiences of activism with a crisis to um, learn something and to, to use these previous experiences now. So for instance, uh, a couple of weeks ago, uh, an activist from uh, Islam in Rio was explaining in a podcast how they are adapting strategies that they have used in the context of floods in, in the slums, you know, of people uh, losing their houses and needing uh, emergency uh, relief. On, on the question of digital activism, that's uh, also another great uh, question. Uh, I agree with Anastasia, the concept has problems and I think has problems because the concept of activism has been under uh, theorized. Uh, we have used the concept, however, of digital activism in our research, defining it in, in quite broad terms to include you know, actions that um, further contentious causes using digital technologies. And we have tried to narrow this down by focusing on different types of appropriation and use of digital 
of technologies. Um, the question uh, for me about uh, are people using those groups to make sense of the crisis? I'm not sure um, whether the groups meant in the question are uh, the Facebook groups or you know the digital uh, groups. I'm going to assume it, it is. Um, that's a hard question to answer right now. We don't have the, the data and, and there is a really um, a lot uh, going on both um, from these uh, poor community groups I focus my presentation on, but also on you know, all these um, conservative and groups that are on, on denial about this crisis and that have a lot of resonance on social social media. And this is related to another question, which is about uh, WhatsApp. How do we study WhatsApp? Because a lot of the conversation has been going on on WhatsApp. Um, people have uh, more access to, to the Internet, but a lot of it is access to WhatsApp groups. Um, and not so much to uh, other uh, social social media necessarily. And this is a, a great challenge. So I, I have known, for instance, of uh, videos that show uh, empty coffins being buried with stones inside. Of course, this is you know a part of the false news uh, campaign. They're saying that there are not so many that people as mainstream media is showing. And these videos are circulating in WhatsApp groups. I have not seen them on Twitter, have not seen them on Facebook. Maybe they are and I have not seen them. But my um, take is that a lot of the conversation is going on in WhatsApp groups and we as researchers have a, a very hard time it's to, to get access to that uh, conversation. And this means uh, a lot in terms of the potential negative effects on this, this crisis in the short term and on democracy in the long term. Yeah. Uh, Mengi, please. Yeah. Um, about the question of uh, access to technology, for example, like uh, the average, uh, according to the figures released by Sina Weibo, is that uh, the average user age of Weibo is 20. So it's very young. And uh, from what we saw from, uh, the, in the super topic, most uh, posts are sent by young people. They're asking help for their parents, for, for their auntie. So, and uh, also I remember that uh, there was a time when uh, a post was sent by uh, elder people, like in his 70s, and he said he just learned, he heard like uh, it, it's helpful to, to it, it's possible to get help by, uh, posting on Weibo, so he learned how to use Weibo and you could see the traditional way he sent a test uh, like uh, the, the language is even the language is different from like uh, what you generally saw on, on internet so definitely like uh, for those most vulnerable people they don't have access even to to uh, Weibo to asking for help so it it could be said like uh, for those most marginalized group, their voices are kind of invisible, mostly invisible online. Yeah. Brilliant, great. Thanks for your answers. So then uh, do another round of questions. There's so many questions that it is getting a bit difficult to <laughs> process them all. I think one theme that is clearly uh, uh, present there and that is also present in current debates about what is going on is the theme of surveillance. I mean, it is more generally a concern with digital activism as a number of scholars, uh, such as, for example, Jenny Morozov some years ago, um, have highlighted that digital activism carries some risks of surveillance because these platforms uh, gather so much data about us and these data can uh, use, be used both by corporations but then also by states to conduct surveillance on people. And I think there there is a very, um, very multi-layered and complex debate, very contentious debate, let's say, on, on surveillance uh, and what is going on. I mean, risks uh, for civil liberties, uh, debates, for example, on contact tracing apps, 
um, with people afraid that this would basically usher in a sort of new panopticon in which we are all being controlled. I mean, more specifically for the purpose of what we are discussing here, I'd say the question is also basically paraphrasing one of our attendance questions. I mean, are activists concerned about these or are people engaged in these uh, online groups uh, concerned about it? And what are actually the, the, uh, the issues uh, in terms of surveillance and, and uh, privacy breaches that these practices uh, raise, if at all? Anastasia, do you want to start? Yes, I'll start then. Um, yes, this is a, um, um, a big issue and I, I'm not sure I have a clear answer to that um, because I think what we see happening is that in, in situations of emergency, uh, people reach out for the more familiar platforms. Um, and I am all for free software and I'm all for sort of like finding better technical solutions and better platforms to actually do all of this uh, that also have sort of like better in terms of surveillance. Um, but the truth is that, you know, the, there is no time. Um, so people reach for the more familiar and I don't think that um, activists are not, um, are not aware of the dangers. Um, but this is what they this is what they have at hand um, and also you know when it comes to trying to offer help to as many people as possible again you have to use applications like whatsapp that a lot of people are using or just a simple telephone a lot of people are using um, so you have that kind of push and pull unfortunately um, when you when you're thinking about the issue in terms of mutual aid groups in particular i think there are several issues here one has to do with the personal data that are held by those groups um, and where they're held and all of that. And secondly, it has to do with um, the guidelines and the terms of service of the platforms that they're using. So yes, they may have some good rules in place when it comes to dealing with personal data and try to sort of like store as, as you know, um, as little as possible, et cetera, et cetera. Um, but they're still using WhatsApp, you know, to do a lot of this activism. So of course they are on a, on a platform where they can't be surveyed, although it is an, it has end-to-end -end encryption. So there has been some talk, like in my group, uh, there has been some talk about Zoom because Zoom is also a new medium and there's a, there was some discussion about whether we should be using Zoom for meetings because these privacy settings are questionable. Uh, but in the end, it was the most, um, the most useful one, the, the easier to use, so we continue using it. Um, so, uh, yes, yeah, so I'm sorry to say this is sort of, this is a, a, a very difficult issue that I, th that I don't think we have solved. There was a, a question. Yeah, there was a question yes. that um, I think it's important to to address if I may change the subject a little bit, um, which is a question about who are the organizers in the UK and in, in Brazil. Uh, in Brazil, uh, and I'm sorry if I didn't make this uh, clear, the organizers are poor people themselves, mostly. You know, they have um, alliances with uh, people from uh, outside of the slums, for instance, but mostly we are talking about bottom-up uh, organizing, local organizing with um, uh, great presence, for instance, of black people, of uh, women that otherwise have uh, little visibility in uh, uh, even even in the literature on uh, Brazilian social movements on Brazilian digital uh, activism whether they are empowered or not which was part of the question I would tend to say uh, yes but I guess it is too early to to tell but I chose to put the spotlight on um, on, on these people um, on purpose, because I think there is a, a lack of attention to what uh, uh, poor communities uh, do. And in this context, in which they are um, most of the, the most affected ones, the most vulnerable ones to the uh, epidemic, I think it's especially uh, important. But today, for instance, to give a, a different example of digital activism, um, different uh, actors, there is a, a national virtual digital uh, online protest uh, in favor of science that is going on and has uh, mobilized, of course, a lot of scientists, 
a lot of universities and people are going to their YouTube channels and, and uh, posting short videos in favor of science. That's a hugely important initiative done you know, by a, a very different set of, of actors. Yeah, Ming. Yeah. Um, I think what, what I saw on Weibo is quite complicated. Like for those patients asking for help, is on the one hand, um, they they are giving up kind of giving up their privacy. They post their names, their address, their contact number, their medical records, and in the beginning, they uh, would want to do it anonymously, but then they get a text from anonymous users saying that maybe you are just spreading rumors. So they have to use their real names and use all the information to prove that they are the patients. And on the other hand, they, they are definitely worried about that. So many people I saw uh, delete their messages after they, they received help because they, they also don't want to uh, lease private information to state online. And another issue is that uh, Weibo is not the only channel that is uh, helping the government uh, to collect information on those patients. So they they could, uh, for example, uh, sign up uh, questionnaires organized by volunteers using more private messaging group about why they still choose to expose their information in a public place. Because by putting there, they could put pressure on the local authorities. See, you, uh, there are still so many people who didn't get help. So it's uh, for them, it's definitely a very difficult choice between um, you want to get help and uh, you also have to give up uh, their, their privacy at that moment. So that's it. Uh, Paolo, we cannot hear you. We can't hear you. Sorry, sorry. <laughs> uh, thanks for all your uh, answers. Uh, I think we can have a final round of questions. Uh, I was trying to make sense of them, and now I cannot see the Q and A chat anymore. But anyway, uh, remembering, trying to summarize the themes that were not covered. I think there was an interesting question about the relationship between, say, online and offline between place and activism and digital activism, which I think would be, it's quite interesting, right? Because it really this crisis in a way, I think is exploding in a way, the, the divide between online and offline and, and further uh, revealing how actually uh, the two are very deeply intertwined. And that comes, that is very evident when we are basically uh, locked in a place and it's surrounding Right, and and how digital media is used for quite different purposes, both organizing us locally and then organizing us translocally, or engaging in uh, uh, criticism, propaganda, more say symbolic action, uh, let's say on, on on the pandemic. And a related question uh, that I think is also important. So I mean, what has happened with digital activism in terms of narrative and counter narrative, uh, for example? Uh, in terms of criticizing uh, government or in, in terms of um, revealing the conspiracy theories for what they are, uh, de denouncing um, the way in which certain political forces are uh, actually giving a very wrong image of this uh, of this virus and the pandemic. I mean, for example, uh, for, for Marisa in this case in Brazil, uh, given that many uh, have asked you questions about that. I mean, what have activists been doing also in connection with these uh, mobilizations on science in order to counter the, the narrative of government on uh, on COVID as being just a flu, right? As Bolsonaro said at some point, right? So I'd say really if mm, in this final round of, of, of interventions, perhaps it'd be, be good if you could uh, if you could engage with these two issues. The first issue is really the relationship between digital activism and place in, in this pandemic. And the second question is uh, digital activism as a form of counter propaganda uh, and of um, verification really of different uh, fake news, conspiracy theories that are emerging and how activists are responding to that. 
Feliz Anastasia. Um, okay. Um, yes, so I think in the example that I um, I talked about, you could see very much that kind of intertwining between online and offline, between the the online and the digital we place. Um, and I think this is a broader trend that we've been seeing with smartphones, right? So you, we always have them on us. Um, so those kinds of boundaries between private and public, between local and global, all of that is being is being sort of like challenged anyway. Um, so I think for me we see a continuation of that. Um, so I think that we need to research more what happens with this very locally based um, organizing, um, particularly when you have um, localities that are then connected to each other in the network. And I think this can be a quite powerful way of actually mobilizing um, because people we do know from research that people participate in action um, when their loved ones or their friends or people next to them are also participating. So this is why I think that this uh, this has a lot of potential. Uh, but I think within sociology and sometimes within sort of like studies of digital activism, we haven't been thinking small. We've been thinking big, you know, we've been thinking of the mass. But here what we have is is sort of like hyper local networks that I think can have like a great effect exactly because they're local and they're small but connected. Um, now on the issue of misinformation, I haven't uh, really um, uh, addressed this or researched it. Um, of course, um, I should say that you know there is misinformation in the groups that I studied. There is misinformation also being circulated, right? Um, with all good intentions, um, sort of people uh, sending information about how to protect yourself from coronavirus from an NHS nurse who told me that this is what I should be doing, right? So these are sort of like gossip chatter networks, uh, those of messaging apps that are easy then to spread misinformation. And what you see is sort of like guidelines emerging um, about what people can share and also some kind of moderation also on Facebook and sort of like rules about if you're not a doctor, just don't send information, medical information, because you don't know whether that this is right or not. Now, um, in the UK, about challenging the, the government and using social media to do this, I think I'll throw that question back to you, Paolo, because I think there is a lot of there is a lot happening. There's a lot of chatter on social media around how the UK government is dealing with a crisis, uh, a backlash against that, not to politicize the crisis and all of that. So we've been having like a lot of back and forth, I would say. Um, but uh, but it's still for us, I, for me, it's still the beginning. And perhaps we're reaching this kind of turning point where we, we're moving from this phase of first response. Let's not politicize this. Let's ensure that people who request help can, can get help and let's, you know, get behind the NHS and all of that. And I think perhaps right now we perhaps we will start moving to a second stage, particularly if the lockdown um, start to get, start, starts to get a little bit loosened up, all of these rules and opened up, um, where there's going to be much more criticism uh, happening and more campaigning happening. Um, yeah, so that's what I had to say. Please, Marisa. About the issue of countering the narrative of uh, the government, yes, of course, this in Brazil has been especially uh, important and like I, I said in the presentation, a lot of the initiatives you are mapping consist of uh, communication campaigns that try and uh, do that. So um, media activists, many of whom had previous experience, for instance, denouncing um, police abuse and human rights violations in, in the slums are using that experience now to um, um, create content and diffuse uh, information on, on the epidemic. Uh, a concrete uh, example that I find very interesting because it actually crosses state civil society lines is uh, uh, an alliance, a collaboration between the Osvaldo Cruz Foundation, which is actually linked to the Ministry of Health and is a very important health institu institution in Rio de Janeiro, is collaborating with um, slums from the city to create you know, scientific reliable information um, and organizations in the slums translate this information and they actually have a seal that they put on, on, on their messages uh, of this foundation that says this is information you can trust on the on the epidemic. So they're just one example of 
many kinds of initiatives that have been uh, going on. Uh, there was a question about uh, whether groups are combined and whether is, there is a, um, a unified platform that connects all the movements. Actually, I think one of the problems here has been uh, fragmentation. It's very hard to choose among hundreds of crowdfunding initiatives which ones uh, need our help uh, um, the the most and uh, there was also a question on uh, the use of non-governmental statistics maybe by um, television and uh, there was a comment that television is still super important to reach the population i couldn't agree uh, more um, non-governmental statistics uh, there is some production of data by these uh, organizations that i have been focusing on uh, one of them did a, a very interesting map of vulnerability in slums in Pernambuco, that's the northeast region of uh, uh, Brazil. Um, they uh, um, did an analysis of the territory that you referenced the, the regions within the slums that were most, that had most vulnerable uh, people according to various um, criteria and they crossed it with information about uh, people who um, had been um, sick with the with the virus and um, in spite of this being uh, very interesting very useful uh, data uh, there was a facebook uh, post just yesterday them telling you know saying that they were uh, trying to get local authorities to um, use this uh, very useful uh, information that we're having difficulties with with that so it's it's part of this uh, struggle Mingi? yeah um about the question uh of those locally based uh, organization um because uh in wuhan during the lockdown people were not allowed to leave their homes so they couldn't go out to uh, like shop groceries or and also because all their public transportations were stopped and uh, it became a problem for those uh, medical workers like how could they commute uh, to the hospitals so there were a, a lot of uh, volunteer work were organized locally based uh, through using WeChat and uh, I talked to a friend in Wuhan and he uh, told me like uh, he has like hundreds of WeChat groups and like each group has one function like this one is used for buying strawberries and the other one is for like organized works like who to take the shift who to take the uh, doctors to to the hospitals so uh, there are a lot of uh, these locally uh, organized uh, uh, community-based uh, activism going on in Wuhan and also about the question of uh, attacking misinformation definitely uh, so similar stuff uh, like uh, different guidelines on how uh, regarding like how the how the virus spreads and uh, most of them I saw from uh, WeChat groups and uh, I could see like in one WeChat group one spreading uh, misinformation and in the other WeChat group one is correcting the exactly the same message and those stuff happened at the same time and I what I want to add to that is uh, I think uh, many uh, platforms while they are uh, quite, uh, they, they tend to keep uh, low key of their intervention user activities. But when it comes to misinformation, uh, they're very happy to discuss like what are the guidelines and what, what users should do. And I saw many uh, censorship or intervention are, are done by platform providers in the name of attacking misinformation. And also many propaganda campaigns were also in the name of attacking misinformation. I think that's uh, very controversial and uh, definitely worth to to look at these issues more yes yeah. great thanks very much for your answers i was looking at the q a chat to see if there's any further questions i mean there were a pair of sparse questions more specifically addressed to speakers I mean, is there any uh, farthest thing or final point you'd like to make? All the people are asking whether it will be available later on the YouTube yes, channel. Yes, definitely. 
uh, that's the advantage of doing things on online that they get automatically recorded. So we will definitely have these available for everyone to see. At the end uh, of these will be uh, uh, available uh, online. Um, and so just to check again, I mean, is there any final point you'd like to make before I make a brief conclusion to the event? Should I take it as a, as a no? Just, <laughs> okay. <laughs> um, let me just say one very quick thing then. Yeah. Um, it's, it's about this effort we're making in our yeah. research group at the University of Brasilia at uh, mapping civil society initiatives of mobilization, which includes the digital activism, but not only digital activism and focuses mainly on poor uh, communities, not only slums, also indigenous and, and so forth. And uh, if people have material that they can uh, send to us, um, I, I had I will send here in the Q&A um, my email and the address of again of the website, which was in my presentation. I'm not sure whether people saw it, but if people can send us uh, material for this, um, I'm right typing it now. There you go. Uh, again, it's only in, in Portuguese, but we're looking forward to uh, putting stuff in in English and having, uh, especially you know, from other countries in the global south. Brilliant. Thanks very much, Marisa. So I uh, think that there'll be probably a chance to do something similar to this. Actually, one attendant was saying that we need to have an update in some uh, weeks or months to see how things have been developing. Uh, I think it was a starting point what we did here today and it was very well attended. Uh, I'd like to thank James Hare, uh, Julia Scarantino and uh, Taylor Annabelle who have been involved in organizing uh, all these and the Center for Digital Culture at King's College London uh, for hosting us and uh, uh, RC47 of the International Sociological Association. This is actually just one of the events we are organizing in these weeks. Something that I really like to flag uh, is next week's uh, uh, event. It's our annual digital culture conference normally done in flesh and bones, but this year, given circumstances, also done virtually. You can still book your seat, your virtual seat for our annual event. Uh, there's already, I think, over 250 people registered or something along those lines. So don't miss your uh, virtual spot in order not, not to regret it for uh, all your uh, life. And I thank very much the speakers for intervening today and give uh, uh, um, for giving us some very detailed accounts of what is happening in different countries, in the UK, in China, in Brazil. And I'd also like to uh, thank our attendants uh, who have submitted so many interesting questions and who have uh, participated, uh, though uh, obviously uh, at a distance in our debate. Uh, thanks very much to you all for your attention and participation and I'm really hoping to see you at further events organized by the Center for Digital Culture and the International Sociological Association. Thanks very much and have a good day. Bye bye.